Uh, I want you to. I want to go back to uh, the 1600s, and maybe the answer is uh, you won't have the answer for us until you finish the book on the 1500s. But that relationship between uh, white supremacy and slavery, and then, and I guess, and maybe even maybe you have to go back even earlier uh, uh, in terms of of capitalism. But there. Lay out for us the sort of the chicken egg scenario. I mean, what was slavery a function of of white supremacy, or was white supremacy constructed to make slavery that much easier, so that we could look upon um, uh, as uh, as Africans as we would, you know, the uh, iron ore we might take from the ground? Well, that's the sixty four dollar question, and it's kept generations of historians busy for decades. I would like to believe that white supremacy was a function of slavery, as you articulated in your latter comment, that there, thereby it was a kind of pragmatic intervention. And I hinted that in, in the early pages of the book we're discussing, when I talk about how in Massachusetts, slave dealers oftentimes were reprimanded for bringing in uh, enslaved Africans into what is now New England. But that, that changed over time, as, as I try to point out. I also, since, I've been, since we, you, you, we broached the question of my 1500s book, I'm also coming to, around to the idea, and I, I think, well, I'll, I'll let this out anyway, even though I haven't written it, and I think it's a, it's a contribution that, you know, actually if somebody else takes the idea, that's fine with me, is that in, or, in order to understand slavery and the rise of white supremacy, it might be useful to understand the Crusades. Because the Crusades, which lasted for hundreds of years, uh, recall that Islam was founded approximately 1,300 years ago and leads to this uh, endless, incessant cycle of conflict between uh, Muslims and Christians. The Crusades were largely pan-European projects. That is to say, you had often Swiss and Germans and French and what we now call Italians and Spanish uniting against particularly the Ottoman Turks, who were Muslims. And then secondly, to use your phrase, it requires a kind of othering, if you like, of mm -hmm. Muslims, uh, seen as this alien population and seen as a civilizational threat. And of course, there's enslavement on both sides. I mean, the Ottoman Turks are enslaving the Christians, the Christians are enslaving the Muslims. And in some ways, uh, I think what happens after the so-called European Age of Discovery, post-1492, is that as the Portuguese in particular, who are also part of the Crusades, begin to sail southwards and then begin to enslave Africans, some of whom, of course, are Muslims, and many of whom, even if they're not Muslims, they're sort of cast as Muslims, as being part of the other. And so I think that in order to understand slavery and white supremacy, it might be useful to understand the Crusades, although, once again, I think that I tend to believe right now that white supremacy arises out of slavery, but I'm trying to keep an open mind because the deeper I go back into history, the more revelations and enlightening factors I, t I tend to encounter. Um, and, and, and to what extent is, I mean... Um the compulsion to enslave people a function of capitalism or capitalism is um, a sort of a, a cousin to just that compulsion on, on some level? Well, first of all, as I'm sure you know, slavery is a socioeconomic system, uh, like feudalism is a socioeconomic system, and uh, capitalism, a socioeconomic system, it often arose from what to do with prisoners of war. I guess you could kill them or you could enslave them. I think what happens with the Americas and the rise of England in the 1600s in particular, you have two relatively new developments. Uh, that is to say that uh, oftentimes people were enslaved because they were thought not to believe in the correct God, <laughs> for example. And then you have, with the so-called Enlightenment, you have these doctrines of science that tend to suggest 
that certain people are superior, certain people are inferior, and therefore they deserve their fate and destiny, which is slavery. Uh, Read, of course, whites versus blacks or whites versus Native Americans, for example. And then that's yoked to this dynamic engine known as capitalism. And that's also a relatively new development. Uh, that is to say, the use of free labor, and then that becomes a very uh, stubborn beast to tame. Uh, that's why the U.S. Civil War was one of the bloodiest conflicts, uh, certainly in North America, if not in human history, but 700,000 people slaughtered over four years, because people did not want to give up their property. Uh, oftentimes when I tell this to my students, you know, uh, being students, they're fiddling with their smartphones as I'm lecturing, right. and I'll go up and snatch their smartphone from their hands and say, I've just confiscated your property, just like property was confiscated from the slave owners in 1865. And just like you're not happy now, they were not happy then. And they were even more unhappy because their property then was walking around claiming to be free and equal, uh, which was contrary to what the slave owners thought. Not only that, but their confiscated property, they were not compensated. Unlike, for example, the slave owners in the Caribbean in the 1830s when London abolished slavery, they compensated the slave owners. The slave owners in Dixie were not compensated, which creates even more fury, which helps to give rise to the Ku Klux Klan and this endless cycle of violence and tensions and resentment that we've yet to extirpate in the United States to this very day. I know that's not, uh, it may not necessarily be, you know, the, the job of a historian, but do you think that that was uh, a mistake? I mean, do you think that the, the, we would see a different level of resentment if, um, and, and, and for the sake of, of argument too, let's just say um, the, the slave owners and the slaves were compensated at that, at that juncture. Do you think it would have had a, made a meaningful difference in terms of the trajectory of, 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 of white supremacy and race relations more broadly in this country? Well, let me dust off my crystal ball once again, uh, and as I peer into my crystal ball, what I seem to see— I'm, I'm glad is, you have that thing so close. <laughs> I appreciate that. The answer is Y-E-S, <laughs> that I think it could have made and would have made a difference. Uh, but then again, I'm only speculating, right. and I'm trained as a historian, not as a fortune teller, unfortunately. Well, so, I mean— so. I, so if, you know, and we would look at this, the, the history of the United States and how much of our success as a country, I guess, to, uh, to shorthand it, has been a function of both the, the genocide that was involved in terms of the indigenous people uh, and the, the slave labor and, the, and, and, and even, I would say, the subjugation following um, uh, emancipation of a significant percentage of our population, um, has, that, has that ended, I mean, as an economic engine, can, can you give, a, as a historian, can you say um, f as a major factor, I mean, because like clearly in the settlement of this country, uh, slave labor is a huge asset. Right. And then in terms of the economy of this country in the uh, first half of the 18th of the 19th century, it is a huge asset. And I would imagine, too, that having a population that is then uh, exploited where you're you know, you're making a dollar 15 off of every you know, what should be a dollar. Um, is also a huge asset in terms of building uh, American wealth, or particularly white American wealth. It, it, had, was there a point where that stopped? Uh, has it stopped? Has it stopped? Well, the United States still is heavily dependent on cheap labor. I mean, as a person who lives part of the year in Texas, uh, part of the so-called Texas boom, is heavily dependent upon millions of cheap laborers, particularly from south of the border. And if you're able to pay people less, not to mention pay people nothing, uh, 
well, then you can generate quite a bit of wealth. And then keep in mind that the African slave trade at its apex was one of the most profitable enterprises known to humankind. You could invest $1 and get $1,700 back, and there are those today who would kill their firstborn for Mm. a 1,700% profit, let alone some African who they did not know. And then we also know that on the cusp of the U.S. Civil War, circa 1860, the most profitable investment in the United States was, of course, the investment in the bodies of enslaved Africans, four million strong, billions of dollars uh, in wealth. And then, of course, (laughs) that wealth was liquidated uh, five years later, causing quite a bit of fury and angst. And that fury and angst has yet to dissipate to this very day. Well, but I mean, I'm saying, uh, so after, um, uh, so uh, during Reconstruction, I imagine you have a lot of uh, former slaves who then begin to work uh, the land for uh, sub-minimum wages. Um, Can we track that, um, that level of exploitation, at least in terms of the African-American community? And can, can we, is there an era where that that ended, where there was some type of parity, at least, uh, or, or are, are, are we still sort of drawing uh, on that exploitation, I guess is what I'm asking. I mean, you, you, I guess you, you, you've answered it to a certain extent with um, uh, uh, immigrant labor, but um, in terms of people who are, you know, who have citizenship, are we still, is it, are we still functioning that way? Or, and, and, and if not, is that, um, is can we see the implications of that, I guess? Is that question, do you, am I clear on the question? I, I think I understand. I mean, are we still functioning that way? To a degree, yes. I mean, obviously, fortunately, slavery has been abolished. But as you know, there's a gender gap in terms of what men tend to earn and what women tend to earn, and that causes and compels many women to work for less, and then that means more profit for some. And then there's a a kind of racial wealth gap, which sociologists have been writing about for years, which oftentimes causes black Americans to be forced to work for less as well. And then someone is profiting at the other end from that kind of exploitation. So the answer, short answer to your question is parity, to use your term, no, in, in terms of racial equality, in terms of wealth, but has that uh, egregious exploitation of slavery has it dissipated? Oh, absolutely, and fortunately. Yeah, I guess I was just trying to get at that uh, that last part that you touched upon uh, wealth. I mean, we know that the, in addition to there being a huge income uh, disparity, there's a there's a tremendous wealth disparity um, uh, between the white and black community, and a lot of that has to do with housing. Which, of course, there's been a plenty of government policies that have pre- prevented. Uh, African Americans from building that type of intergenerational wealth through uh, their homes, and then that is exploited because uh, you know uh, you have a higher incidence of people having uh, less intergenerational wealth and uh, need to, puts them in, I guess, a, a weaker bargaining position when it comes to work.